everyone. I'm here with my friend, Mike Tribe. I met Mike a few years ago because I just stopped by and knocked on his door because I wanted him to make me a barn quilt. But I found out he only makes them for friends, so I became a friend, and now I have two. <laughs> but Mike is very interested in barn quilts, and he's traveled how many trails? Oh, probably six or eight. Six or eight trails. And he has put barn quilt blocks on barns everywhere across Oregon and Washington. Washington and quilt shops and barns and friends houses so this is you tell us what this is and I don't sell them he doesn't sell them this is not a, this is not a business nope <laughs> uh, this is an Ohio star and this particular design is very common it's also called an eight-point star and it's a uh, replica of the design of the very first barn quilt that was made back in uh, 2000, back in Adams County, Ohio. And this particular barn quilt back there on that trail uh, is an eight foot by eight foot panel and it's still hanging. And I, and I was actually able to see it when I was back there touring. Same colors and same layout. And I've always liked the simplicity of it and it's just elegant. And who did that block? that barn quilt block at back in Ohio? Uh, the Adams County uh, Chamber of Commerce, I think, who, who organized the barn quilt trail uh -huh. back there, they had a number of artists that were doing barn quilts back uh -huh. there. And Donna Sue Groves, who came up the, with the original idea of barn quilts, I don't believe she actually painted this one, which was the first one that hung, but she did do some for her mother uh, on that quilt trail back in the county. And that idea that she had for making one for her mother, who was a quilter, started the whole barn quilt art movement. And then the county uh, chamber of commerce picked up on that idea and they promoted the quilt trail back there. It was the very first one in the country that uh, was put out. And this was in the 2000s? Yes, 2000. 2000s. So let's go look at your other ones. So what's this one? This barn quilt here is a five foot by five foot. The Ohio star we just looked at was a four foot by four foot. This one is a five by five. It's in two panels. There's a top and a bottom with a seam in the middle. And I, it was the very first barn quilt that I made. And I oh. made it because it was a, uh, it was a replica of the motif on a quilt that my daughter made for me. And so when I was looking for a pattern for a barn quilt, I picked this off of that quilt that she made for me. And it's this pinwheel or a windmill and I have windmills on my property. And so it's kind of a windmill motif, which I like. Yeah. This one here, I've actually repainted since I very, when I first did it, it's on plywood and I don't use plywood anymore and so the uh, paint adheres better to a material that I use now called MDO. But five by five, this is the only five by five one that I've ever done. I, since material is so expensive, I use, uh, try to maximize the material and I use uh, four by eight sheets of MDO, which is called medium density overlay. It's specifically for making signs. Again, this one is on plywood. Uh, but uh, it's for outside use. MDO is a sign board and it's like plywood, but it has a veneer on the surface that is impregnable to weather and moisture. Um, but this one here is a five footer and I didn't know any better. So I just tried to make one that look, would look good on the, on the dimensions of this wall here. Okay. This is sort of a, interesting abstract more modern type of design that i really liked uh it's i've always tended to go more with primary colors because i like the way that they pop and so this one here is made on mdo it's a half inch mdo it's a four foot by four foot block and it was fun to lay out has a black background which really makes the the colors pop and also looks real good on the white wall of the barn. 
What's this one? This one is a Mariner's compass. And I did this one because this side of my house needed something on this big white wall before I had the plants here. So uh, I wanted something that was very colorful and really stood out. And so this Mariner's compass, again, it's a four foot by four foot, one piece of plywood. It's not MDO, it's plywood. This one here has lasted a little bit longer without paint checking like the other ones that are out of the weather because it's underneath the eaves on my house. Yeah, that's pretty. Um, oh, look at this beauty. Do you know the name of this block? This block is called Love's Blossom. Oh yeah. And I did this one for uh, on. one of my cousins. Look at that. My cousin had a liver transplant recently oh. and so I made this for her. Wow. And it's uh, just finished. This is on half inch MDO. And it started here. And I just print out a picture of, of it online and then uh, use that picture as a guide to lay the uh, lines out for it. So this is an example of one that I've just finished. Awesome. And I usually sign them. Oh yeah, let's get this. Mine signed. I usually... I, I, oh, the name's on it. And this one here, I actually put the name of the block on here, which I've never done before. I and have I, a tribe. Two tribes. An original. Two, I have original. original. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right here. Okay. So this is the block. He's doing two blocks today, I think. Um, but this is the one we're doing now. And this is a piece of MDF. M the MDO. No. MDO. And this comes in uh, four by four foot by eight foot sheets. It's uh, mm -hmm. these are these are two foot by two foot blocks. And so if I was to cut an entire sheet down, I could get 16 barn quilts out of oh. one sheet. And then you primed it, you have a certain paint you use. Well, this, the the MDO comes primed on one oh, side okay. usually, but I don't count on that prime. And so what <laughs> I do is I prime them myself. And what I have is just a regular. Oh, kills. Interior, exterior latex primer. And mm -hmm. I've been experimenting with a gray uh, tint for my primer instead of white. So I had the, sh the store mix this gray up for me and just put some tint in it. Uh, when you're using grape or when you're painting with reds and oranges, um, reds don't cover very well uh, over white primer. And so if you use gray, you can decrease the number of coats and get a better coverage uh, with reds primarily. And so I'm experimenting with gray primer and I'm not convinced that it's all that, so. Hmm. so. So this one he drew and he had to erase it because he's gonna redraw it. So I did a little bit of layout and which wasn't right. The dimensions weren't exactly right. And so I erased the lines and this this one next to it here is is going to be the other design and it it hasn't been marked on yet so the first thing you got to do when you're laying these out is you have to figure out what type of a grid or what type of a layout pattern you have and they're all different uh, conventional barn quilts have what what are called just a normal rectangular grid layout, meaning that you lay out evenly spaced blocks, either three, three block blocks by three blocks or six by six or seven by seven. Um, some of them are a combination of grid layout and a radial layout. In other words, laying lines out from the center out as opposed to a rectangular grid. This one here, this one here is a symmetrical star layout, an eight point star, but the, the design on the inside of it with these triangles is dependent on the dimensions of the points between here and here on these stars. And so that dimension has to be exactly right in order for this triangular 
or triangle pattern to lay out correctly in the center. Otherwise, the points don't match where they need to match. They don't match in this. They don't land in the center and the triangles are different sizes. And so in order to get this one to lay out, really difficult layout because of that, as opposed to one that's just a straight grid pattern. This will be done on the other board. And this is, this is a modified Ohio star also. You can see it's an eight point star. And it's not going to be a, a grid either because you can see that this square here and these ones in the corner are not the same dimensions as these squares here. So this one here also is not a, not a simple grid layout. Okay. This is the layout we're going to do today, and we're going to, we're going to call this a four foot, a four by four grid or patch layout. So each one of these sections is, is the same dimensions and there'll be four blocks of the same dimensions going vertically and horizontally. And so what we have here is we have a piece of material that's 24 inches by 24 inches. So 24 divided by four is six inches. And so we'll have six inch, six inch blocks going all the way across both directions. And so I'll just take my yardstick and I'll mark at six, in, six inch intervals. And it's very important that you always measure from the same edge. Ah. So this way I can get a, a, a line drawn straight across the board. I'll do the same thing going this way. And laying these barn quilts out, in order to get the points to match and to land where you want them, you the measurements have to be very, very precise. And I'll show you why in just a minute. Okay, so now what we have is we have markings for a four by four grid, one, two, three, four, and we can go ahead and Scribe the lines. And I just make a very light, very light line with a pencil. And I'm not the ultimate authority on making barn quilts. A lot of the techniques that I use, I've just discovered. Now, I, how many do you think you've made? Um, I've probably made a couple of hundred. That's a lot. Yeah. They all kind of run together after a while. So we'll draw these lines. I actually have a couple hanging over in England. Oh. Yeah. Why? Well, I have a friend that lives over there and she wanted some for her English garden. Oh. It's actually an old girlfriend from high school. <laughs> okay. Believe it or not. <laughs> She's married now. Good thing you're single. You can get away with saying that. <laughs> so four by four. So here's the four by four grid. And now once we have that, we can start laying out the diagonal lines. And the lines diagonally on this are all 45 degrees. And so it's very easy. You don't have to measure any angles other than that. And so the reason, the way that I draw those lines is by using a square, just a construction square. And I run it up along the edge. And then scribe the lines along the diagonal according to the the pattern that I've got here. So some of these lines don't go all the way through the pattern, like for instance right here. This is all one color, so I don't need this, this line to go through this section right here or this section right here. If I did, 
I would have to erase it because sometimes paint, the paint colors, certain colors don't cover up lead, pencil lead real well. In this particular case, I'm not going to rely on this, this square. I'm just simply going to draw from the points to the points. And as you can see, when you draw your lines diagonally, they really have to go exactly through these points. I hope you can see that. I can see that, yeah. So you, so why that's important is because that's where you're masking. And so you want all your points to... So this is the line you just drew. That's right. This okay. is the line I just drew. And I went ahead and drew it all the way through. And then I'll erase the parts of it that I don't need once I get the... Okay. If you take a look over here at this one that's that's finished, you can see how precise those points end up. And they have to be, these measurements have to be exact in order for these points to line up exactly how they, how they do. When you're masking, you have a little bit of leeway. You can kind of bend your masking tape a little bit just to uh, ma make the uh, corners or the points match uh, where they need to match. And I'll show you that in a minute. So let me let me get the rest of these these down here. Okay, so it's all drawn out. So there we have the basic four by four grid and the diagonals where we need them and we can take a look at the pattern and we can determine exactly where we need to draw additional lines. In this particular case, there is a square in the middle. There are these points here, which is here and here. There's flying geese. <laughs> flying geese. There's going to be a line that goes from here to here to make this square. So let's lay that one out next. And it'll go all the way to this corner up here. Do you know what this block is called? No, I don't. Yeah, I'm curious now. I'm going to go look it up. <laughs> A lot of people ask me where I get my ideas for these blocks, and what I do is I just, uh, I subscribe to a barn quilt Pinterest group, and so I get daily I think daily emails from Pinterest on barn quilt designs. And I look at those and I Google uh, barn quilts and then I pick out designs that really speak to me. Um, I like to do new ones that I haven't done before. And so this one here I've done before two or three times. Oh. But uh, it's a it's a really nice one to do, and it's it's easy and quick to lay out. Okay, so we've got these these squares done, these corner squares done. Then we have to draw this line. Let's see this line here here off the corners of this square. And those lines go all the way through, all the way through the pattern. So all of this starts with the with the uh, initial four by four grid, and so it's very important 
to get the measurements on that initial grid correct. Okay. Looks good. Now we've got, we've got these drawn. Now we draw the inside square here. I'm gonna use a smaller. And if you start out with a accurate grid to begin with, all of these points will line up as you go across the diagonals, especially. Okay, so there's the center square. Now we have to draw these four in here. And these four here come from this point to this point, and they're a diagonal that goes this way. So we basically could have extended this line. Once we have these lines drawn, then we've got the entire block laid out. Now this, now this block has got all the elements that we need to, to, do, the, to do the design. Except now I'm looking at it and I notice that Oh, I missed, yeah, my, my pencil lifted up just a little bit here. Missing a little line right here. You have to take a good close look at it when you get it done and make sure you didn't miss anything. After you look at these for a while, you, it's hard to see things after, after a while. Okay, now we've got everything we need for the, for the block. Okay. Yes. Next, you're going to tape it, or are you going to erase it? Well, I think I'm going to erase these. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't have to be extremely clean erasing, uh, just as long as the majority of the lead is gone. So sometimes I don't draw these extra lines all the way through, but I just wanted to demonstrate, you know, just how these grids are laid out. You know and how the lines, you know, affect the the overall uh, block layout, and so I'll go through and then I'll erase all the lines that aren't needed. And a lot of people like to uh, tape according to colors, and so and, and I do too. So what I typically do is I I try to. Is this, this the color this you're is, going to paint it? it? It's it may not be these colors, but it'll it'll be this same uh, pattern scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, I might I might go with this color. Uh, the, where it's going is on a gray house, and so this mm -hmm. has got a little bit of gray in it, which I think would look good on the house. But I don't particularly like to to color match the barn quilts up up against what they're mounting on. I, I like to have them completely different color schemes so that they they stand out and not blend in with the rest of the barn or the house. So, but this one here has got enough purple on it. Uh, I might I might stay with with the color. I'm not very good at picking colors. It's one of my weaknesses. I, I can help you, and it'll be pink. I really struggle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything you do would be green. I know, right? <laughs> I really struggle s selecting colors. So what I usually do is I usually wait until uh, I pick the 
basic block design and then I wait until the end to try to actually pick my colors. And then I'll go over here to my paint. Uh, these are all my paints in here. And what I use is, I use Bare Marquee. It's a exterior semi-gloss that I get at Home Depot. And the reason I, I like Bare is because the Marquee, uh, color, it covers very good. It's a high quality paint. It resists fading and um, Home Depot is always open. I can get paint whenever <laughs> I want them. Any color too. Any color and they, they yeah. mix them up. And so I have all my paints in here. I usually buy quartz and this is all my inventory of colors that I've got. So I, what I'll do is I will you know, pick some, I'll, I'll pick some colors out that I think would look good. And then I'll kind of just kind of lay them out together. And I'll just kind of look at it and just kind of see if those colors look look good together. So this one here has got some white in it. It's got some gray, black, some blues. So this is similar to what this purple is different. So I might pick a little bit lighter, lighter shade of purple. Where's my purples? might go with something like that. I don't know. I, 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 find I, really, out. I really have to think about the colors. I, we'll, what we'll do is we'll pick, assuming that we're going to go with the same design with the color scheme, I'll pick one of these colors and then I will mask it off so that I will paint that just that one color in all places where it occurs on the, on the block. And so I think what we'll do is we will uh, uh, mask off the blacks and we'll do all the black um, squares first. Okay, say that again. I tend to uh, try to lay down the dark shades first and then go with the lighter shades after that. The main reason is sometimes you get a little bit of bleed through underneath your tape and when you paint the lighter color after the dark color then the bleed through from light to dark would be into the dark and the black would cover uh, that light bleed through paint up a lot better when you touch it up. Okay. So we're going to we're going to mask off the blacks and what I do this is frog tape and it's the green frog, frog tape flog tape and what I do is I pull out a section and I position it right at the point on one end of the line and then I lay it down right on the line. So you completely cover that line. It, it's right on. It's, it's right, right on. on it. Right okay. on the line. Yeah. And then instead of tearing the tape, I just have a knife that I just do it that way. That way, it doesn't it doesn't pull and stretch the tape. Ah. So you get less bleed through because you're not pulling and stretching the tape. That's that's one reason. But I'll show you the the main reason here in just a minute. Okay. Okay, so that's one, and then this one, this little block right here is also black, and so I'm going to go ahead and mask it off also, and so you want to get your edges right up against one another here, so uh, you, you just take the tape and you just kind of move it side to side until it lines right up, because what we're going to do is we're going to cut this tape out in just a minute, we're going to trim it. Oops. And once I, once we do this one, I will show you how to. We won't. I won't tape all of them at the same point. Getting getting the points precise is done next here, and I'll show you how that's done. And then we have one also in the the big black center square. Frog tape has a has a special formula 
on their adhesive that when it reacts to a moisture of any kind, it, it tends to um, seal that edge, which is, which is unique to frog tape. I've never found another tape that, that does it as well. Okay, so I'm not gonna do all the other black black ones, but, but I, we've got more black ones here, 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 and here. We're gonna go ahead and do those at some, uh, in a little bit. But the next step, the next step is to trim these corners. And so this is how you get these corners exactly meeting so you you go ahead and run your your tape along the lines and then you what I do is I put my knife blade right on the edge there and then line it up with the other edge and you don't worry so much about cutting into the board because along that line it's going to be painted anyway then you get a very exact point, which is the most important part of these barn quilts, I think. I mean, when you, when you make a quilt, you don't want your points to be off, right? No, I do not. I take them <laughs> out until they're perfect. That's right. <laughs> So that's how you do your taping. taping and cutting. And then the next part for rubber around, around a screen, you know, a oh, screen door, I've you, never you seen put one that of those. rubber in there. Yeah. Anyway, it has a nice flat surface. And what I do is I just run it along the edge. So quilters use something that's a roller uh -huh. to flatten seams if we don't want to go to the iron. Some people have rollers and I've seen those wooden, little wooden rollers. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to buy anything, and I had this already, so. Okay. And it works just fine. So you're just sealing it, the edges of the tape. Right. Okay. And this technique results in virtually no bleed through of paint underneath the, the tape. And especially right there at the corners, you want to get those down really good. And there, you, and there you go. So I also use Floetrol, or this is a Sherwin-Williams brand. It's, a, uh, it's an additive that you put in that causes the paint to flow a little bit better. And if you have ridges in the paint from brush strokes, those will tend to level out with this stuff. And so I, I mix, mix it in. And this with is the, the paint. black. Yeah, this is the black. This is just a, just a bare, Basic black, there's nothing. Okay, brushes. So just like all hobbies and stuff, the tools that you use are most important. And so I take really good care of my brushes. And what I tend to use is a Wooster Pro with a tapered, with a tapered tip. And um, this is a uh, multi, what they call multi-medium brush. It can be used for oils or latex paints. And I tend to use the one inch mostly because the designs are small enough that a one inch is the best fit. And then I have a couple of smaller brushes here for the touch up. This is my little artist brush that I use just for touching up the edges after I'm done. And a little bit larger one for larger edges. But I take really good care of my brushes. I don't loan my brushes out to anybody. And um, <laughs> For larger barn quilts that have large areas, um, I tend to use a small detail roller. In this particular case, this design is not large enough. It's more difficult to get the roller in, in these areas. And so I won't use a roller on this particular design, but if I was doing a four by four or an eight by eight, I would use a roller to paint the, the design. This one here, we're just gonna use just a just the brush. Let me get my 
paint over here. Oh, that's a little paint table. Yeah, I don't set my paints on, on here. Sometimes I'll hold the can, <laughs> um, but I like to keep all of my supplies off out of the way. And I'll tend to just dip the, the, ed, the end of the paint about a half, three quarters of an inch into the paint dip the brush in no further than that and I don't I don't brush it off or wipe it off I just just let it kind of like that and then I try to paint eventually I'll, I'll paint all in one direction after I'm done with this particular area here what I'll do is is I'll go back over it like this and with my brush at about a 45 degree angle I'll smooth it out. Sometimes there'll be air bubbles in the paint and that'll tend to take those out. This will take two coats and so I'll, uh, I'll do all of these in one fairly light coat. The first coat is, is I don't put on heavy coats and the reason for that is is if you put on heavy coats the paint doesn't dry real thoroughly through the whole paint and the um, uh, it'll lift off when you go to remove the, the tape. Yeah, and all those brush strokes, so those will those will tend to level out with that flow troll in the paint. Yeah, the one of the painters used that when he paints the window sills, mm -hmm. the molding. Yeah, it's a really good product. How much do you put in there in that? Uh, not much. Okay. This little bottle here will treat sixteen gallons. Oh. And so I use one fluid ounce okay. in a quart. Okay, so let me get let me get the rest of these. What are you cleaning the brush in? Just clean water. Oh, that looks clean. Yeah, it's not clean. <laughs> okay. And then I'll just press the water out of the brush. How long does it typically take to blow, take to blow dry them dry? Uh, on an 80 degree day. Oh yeah. <laughs> 85. I mean, we're having a nice warm summer day. I don't use the blow dryer, and I usually let it set for about half hour, 45 minutes before I put the second coat on. It doesn't take long. Okay. Now he's doing the second coat. Yeah. Second coat's going on. And as soon as the, as soon as I get all the second coat on, I'll take the tape off, and and I'm just going to put two coats on this. Uh, black tends to cover pretty good, so especially with the gray uh, primer. And you're brushing in all the same direction. I am. After I use this these cans of paint for a while they get little flecks of stuff in them um, you know off the rim of the can and stuff and so going over the you know going over the paint with your brush afterwards it tends to brush the, that stuff out yeah you might need to get a new can so I've got a new can oh, in there okay. yeah. <laughs> but I just have to remember that these this is not the Mona Lisa. It's a barn quilt. It's got to be <laughs> so outside. I'm, I'm just not. It's not that. It doesn't have to be that. Okay, sorry, I'm coming to my finger.
So now you have two coats on. Now the second coat is on, we can go ahead and start taking the tape off. And the tape, removing the tape, um, it's not tricky, but you want to be sure that you do it in the right way. The way that I do it is I always pull close to the board and away from the edge. And what that tends to do is it tends to cut the, cut the paint. This is really wet, so we're not going to get any lifting on this one. But So you immediately pull the tape off yes, after you paint that I, second coat. I, right. I just put this coat on, and it's not even tacky yet. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll, well, first of all, I'll never get in a hurry removing this tape. But sometimes I'll take and, um, instead of doing these long runs, I'll take the knife. And before I start pulling in this direction, I'll just go ahead and cut this like that. That way I can get a fresh pull going this direction. And you can see Perfect. how there is virtually no bleed through at all on this tape under this tape and that's all because of the way the frog tape is don't worry about that it'll cover up and what I'll do is I'll I'll tend to work from the outside in when I'm removing tape and the, so the inside will be the very last thing that I take out, take off. Okay, that's, that's what happens when you don't pull the tape off correctly. I'm glad that happened so we can at least show them. Show. Is it because you didn't cut the corner or? It's because I, I pulled it I okay. pulled it instead of tore it or cut it. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to, I, I pulled it sideways like that mm -hmm. and that lifted the paint instead of cutting it like that, you see. Mm -hmm. But that'll, that'll touch up just fine. That won't be a problem. See, see the way that that's lifting there. Mm -hmm. That's because that's because I'm I'm lifting straight up mm -hmm. instead of. And then when I come up, up, come up on a point right here, so it'll be pulling up against this edge and against this edge. And so what I'll do is I'll change the orientation of the tape like this. And so it pulls towards the, towards the point. So this, this little area right here where the paint lifted up when I removed the tape, that normally doesn't happen, but I was in a hurry today. But what'll happen here is, uh, when I when I paint this triangle right here, there'll be a sharp edge with the with this color paint along that line, and so I'll take a small artist brush and I'll just fill in that black, and it'll go right up against the edge of that paint, or this color paint, and it'll be a nice straight line. So I don't have to worry about masking it or anything like that. I'll just paint up against that line. The next thing is I'm gonna demonstrate how to paint a color that's adjacent to a patch that you've already painted. And the trick on doing that is to be sure that the edge 
the edges overlap just a hair so you're not leaving any gap in between the two colors that moisture weather rain ice wow. can get can get in under and so what i do is let's say for example that this is this is primer or this is painted and i'm going to put this color here down so um I'll, let's do it the other way this one here is already painted and i'm going to I'm going to paint this one. So since this is dry, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the paint just so a sliver, just a sliver of this green shows along that edge. And then as I put my tape down, I'm just going to move it. If you zoom out just a little bit, I'm just going to stretch the tape out so it's all the way along that line. And then I can move it side to side and looking straight down, I want to be sure that I get just a sliver of that green showing. It's really hard to see, but there is just a sliver of the green showing. Maybe if I did it on, <clears throat> along the red here. Yeah, because they're on green on green. So you can see just a little bit of red there. Mm -hmm. That's enough of an overlap of the paint so that when I, when I paint this block here, it overlaps that red just a hair and closes up any gap that might be between these two colors. So that's really important. And again, I just start right at the point. And you have to look straight down, straight down at it. Yeah, it comes straight down. You can see how much of the red is showing there. Just, just a hair. It's not even a 64th of an inch. Just a little bit of an edge. Tell us what we do next. So I'll let this color dry overnight. And then tomorrow I'll pick another color to do. Mm -hmm. And between now and then, I need to decide what my color scheme is gonna be. So I'll have to pick my blues and my purples and all the other colors that are gonna go into this one. Kind of lay it out. I might even go to my computer. I have a computer program that I lay these out on and I can put the colors in and sort of see what looks good together. Um, and then I'll mask off the next color. But let me show you how to do a little bit of touch up because on this one that's done over here, I just noticed that there's a little bit of a little bit of a paint lift that I didn't notice before. And I'll show you how easy it is to do. It's right there. You can just oh, yeah. barely see a little bit of the primer, mm -hmm. the gray primer. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is here is we have a just a little bit of paint that was lifted off along this edge right here and I just noticed it so I'm going to touch it up and basically I've just got a little artist brush here and just a little bit on the end of that brush and I'll just follow that line right along the pink and because there's a paint edge there the paint will not flow over into the pink it'll it'll flow right up against that edge so you always get a nice clean touch up. All right. I'm going to try to stand over here. So this is something that um, is out in front of his house. Windmill corner because he has a windmill back there, right? Yep. And then the sign has another side to it. 